hope you are ready for a little change of pace. That was great though, wasn't it? And thank you, Lisa, for that lovely introduction. I must say that my play map really would have just consisted of a television. But hands up all the parents in today. Don't panic, I'm not gonna interact with you. Um, well, I have got some good news for you guys because I am simply going to make you feel fantastic. You are just gonna go, we are the best parents in the world when you've heard my story. Um, and I am aware of the fact that I'm the only thing standing between you and a drink. So, you know, I will try and keep it pacey. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm basically going to chat to you about is uh, my parents and I guess my story in relation to them and how I kind of came out the other side, really. Uh, look, Anne and Tony Lucy were unusual people. There's no getting around that. I mean, I do think some of it was generational and cultural. They were Irish, but there's also no getting around the fact that they were just a bit nuts. But... <laughs> Of course, the thing is, I know very little about their childhood. And I must admit, I only ever met my mother's mother. And she was honestly the sort of woman who you'd skip up to as a child and you'd go, how are you, Gran? And she'd go, lovey, I'm just waiting to die. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you did want to say, not as much as the rest of the family is, Gran. <laughs> There wasn't a lot of joy in Gran, I'm afraid. And I don't know if that's why her daughter Anne was as anxious as she was, but my mother was just afraid of everything. But nothing more so, apparently, than running water. Which is why I was told, up until the age of 15, that the shower was broken. This meant that we simply wiped ourselves down with a kitchen sponge. I mean, it was a clean sponge, you know, we weren't freaks or anything. <laughs> and what was really odd, yeah, there's more, what was really odd is that mum knew that the norm was indeed to have a shower. So if I had a friend over to spend the night, which God knows was pretty rare, mum would actually burst in first thing in the morning and pretend that she'd have had a shower. She'd really come in and go, oh, I just had the best shower. Oh, that was a great shower. That was a bloody great shower. How oh, I loved that shower. And I never had the heart to tell her that, you know, mum, people have showers, but they don't really discuss them. <laughs> You know, it'd be like, I don't know, giving brushing your teeth a score out of 10. Yeah, that was a nine, that was a top rush. She had some very unusual ideas about medicine. Do we all know what creosote is? Yeah, you know, termite repellent, very toxic. That's all you need to know. As a child, I had a head cold. Mum suggested to me that I just pop up to the shed and have a whiff of creosote to clear my sinuses. <laughs> Granted, I'm pretty sure it would have cleared them, but I'm also pretty confident it would have left me with just a neck. <laughs> but, um... That would have been okay as far as mum was concerned because I would have weighed less. <laughs> because mum, I'm afraid, was an obsessive dieter and laxative abuser. She actually put me on a diet when I was eight. So my brother and father would sit down to a roast and mum and I would sit down to a bowl of yogurt, low calorie raspberry cordial and bran all mixed together. It's a little bit like eating sweet dirt. But, um, golly, I was regular, I'll give her that. <laughs> and she was very overprotective. She didn't let me do anything. I wasn't allowed to take swimming lessons, I wasn't allowed to ride a bike. I still can't do either of those things. I wasn't allowed to play sport, I wasn't allowed to spend the night at other people's houses. I have started doing that. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go on rides at the show, so, you know, no wonder at 22 I tried heroin. <laughs> she... <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't take. But she also had some very odd ideas about cleaning. 
She hated housekeeping, which is completely fair enough, but what was hilarious about it is that all the surfaces were clean, but if you opened a cupboard, it was kind of like a moth palace or a weevil fun park. And we had shag pile carpet, but instead of vacuuming it, mum would rake it. <laughs> it just looked clean. So that will kind of put you in the ballpark with mum. Dad, well, one of my earliest memories is of our family going to the football and dad pulling his raincoat over his head and pretending he was mentally challenged so that he could get in for free. <laughs> um, and let me tell you, our family never missed a game of football in 17 years. If I was sick, oh, mum and dad would still take me to the football. They'd simply lock me in the car and check on me at half time. This was before casinos. They were visionaries in many ways. Uh, dad wore a lot of makeup. He wore a lot of foundation powder and eyebrow pencil, and I mean a lot. I was kind of glad he shuffled off before he reached for the mascara and the lipstick. And he also gave me some very unusual advice over the years. Probably my favorite example is uh, he and I were having lunch when I was in my, I reckon my early 20s, and I admitted to him that I'd, I don't know, been feeling a bit depressed. It was probably about work or something. My father has turned to me without skipping a beat and has said, do you think you'd be happier if you had a breast reduction? <laughs> because let's face it, you're completely out of proportion. And I always found it intriguing that a parent could make the leap from point A, which was my child is unhappy, to point B, which was so obviously she should have her jugs lopped. <laughs> Like an odd leap to make. Um, it'd be fair to say that my father was pretty fond of a drink. Uh, towards the end, though, he was actually putting brandy in his chicken cup of soup. Mmm, make mine a scotch and chunky pea and ham soup, thanks. And I should also admit that I wound up being fairly fond of a drink. In fact, I think I was drunk for about 15 years. And that might have had a little bit to do with me sorting out my childhood. But to give you an idea of my behavior in my 20s, um, I remember one night, a bunch of us had been drinking all day, and then we went to a party. We got very drunk at the party. There may have been some drugs as well. Anyway, we woke up the next morning, because we all just sort of passed out there. And someone was trying to have a conversation with me and I remember waking up and thinking, oh no, I need to get to a toilet very quickly. Where I was pretty busy from both ends. And essentially, I threw up on my own underpants. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, I was at a complete stranger's house. I had no idea what to do, so I simply took them off and threw them out the window. <laughs> It was just a shame that I didn't realize that the window faced the front of the house, and we all walked past them when we left. <laughs> On a brighter side, um, Dad did have a tremendous sense of humor. He was actually a very funny man, although it does have to be said that some of the things that tickled Dad's fancy were a little questionable. He loved blowing air up the family pet cat's bottom. There was no actual lip sphincter contact, but Dad would follow the cat around going <laughs> Which of course just sent him into a demented frenzy, but that cat had no hope because he was never let out of the house, so he was always trying to escape and was just basically just this kind of vicious neurotic. And what Mum and Dad would do at mealtime is they would put the cat in a cage, which they would then put on the dining room table. <laughs> now, what would also often happen at mealtime, because of course mum was always starving, so she would bolt her food. So at least once a week, she would start choking at the table. So down one end, you had this creature going <laughs> and down the other end, you had mum going <laughs> So that made it exciting. Um, <laughs> nearly as exciting as Lucy family holidays. We just had the one. We, uh, <laughs> 
We drove from Perth to Albany and years later someone said to me, oh, so did you stay in a caravan or a motel? And that's when I remembered that when the Lucy family travelled, we chose to stay in the car. <laughs> so mum and dad sat in the front seats reclined, you know, they were pretending they were on a plane, I guess. My brother got to lie along the back seat, but I was lucky enough to be able to lie on the back floor with that gorgeous hump in the middle. <laughs> but no, it's actually left me with a tremendous legacy because honestly, if I'm ever feeling a bit stressed out, you know, like I need a bit of time out, I just pop a couple of filthy rubber mats on the floor, stick a brick in the middle, lie on top of them and hey-ho, I'm on holiday. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this will shock you, but I moved out of home as quickly as I possibly could. <laughs> but that meant that I then started receiving some very unusual letters from my mother. And the most unusual one was just after she'd done some rebirthing. Now, she was a staunch Catholic, but she gave everything a crack. For those of you who aren't across the whole rebirthing thing, you know, it's a breathing technique, and it's meant to help you remember your own birth and clear the trauma from it. Now. Mum, never one to follow the norm, didn't actually remember her own birth. No, she remembered giving birth to me. And she described it in explicit detail, which she popped in a letter and sent to me. And I remember reading it and just finding it so disturbing that I put it in the bin immediately. <laughs> Imagine how disturbing I found it a couple of years later when I found out I was adopted. <laughs> and that's a fun story. Um, so I found out I was adopted at the age of 25 on Christmas Day, which was great. Um, whole family gathered around and just burst into jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. We're not your parents, your real mum gave you away. Hey! So at least it was festive. <laughs> That's not quite how I found out, but it was a family Christmas, and golly, don't you love those? Let's get a whole group of people together who haven't seen each other all year, who have nothing in common. Let's get them to drink a keg of beer each and then tell each other what they really think of each other. <laughs> so relaxing. So. Not surprisingly, it did come out after a little bit of a family tiff. I mean, nothing too serious, just my father trying to beat the crap out of my brother while screaming, I'm going to kill you, you effing C. And he wasn't saying, funny old chook. So... <laughs> That pretty much cleared the room, as you can kind of imagine, and I was left with my sister-in-law and I said to her, wow, haven't you married into a fun family? And she's gone, there's something else you don't know. And so, of course, I went, don't tell me Santa isn't real. <laughs> Zing! And she said, no, it's just got to do with you. And, you know, I guessed, basically, because, frankly, how many things can it be? Oh, my God, I'm blind. Nobody told me. <laughs> did have some fairly interesting conversations with mum and dad after that. I said to mum, mum, why didn't you tell me that I was adopted? And she said, I forgot. <laughs> now, I know she was trying to be positive, but at the time it was not the answer that I was chasing. But the worst thing about it all was that it made me feel like a complete idiot because it had never, ever entered my mind. Even though on more than one occasion, I suddenly started to remember, um, you know, when I was a kid, mum would just walk into the room and give me this speech for what I thought was no apparent reason. You know, adopted children are the luckiest children in the world because their parents really want them and they're specially chosen. And you know, I'd be watching the telly and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Glad I'm not one of those weirdos. <laughs> And as you can probably imagine, all of my old friends, like the people who knew my family when I told them, they all reacted in exactly the same way. They all went, 
oh my God, you're adopted. You must be so relieved. <laughs> And um, they were, uh, I'm looking at that clock and realizing I just don't understand it at all. So let's just push on. Um, <laughs> but I will say that, uh, in truth, our family didn't actually ever really recover from that Christmas day. I'm kind of absolutely fine with it all now. It did take a little while to get to that point. Um, my mum's health went completely downhill after that day. So dad became her 24 hour carer, which sent him a little loopy because uh, he was very much used to his independence. So he and I had a falling out over this joke. Did anyone else's father's testicles seem to be doing an impersonation of Houdini? Because I tell you now, it didn't matter what my father wore, bathers, shorts, those little guys were always escaping. <laughs> I can honestly say that as a small child, the only thing that I saw more of than my father's balls was Gilligan's Island. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm not proud. <laughs> But the irony was that for once, that joke was actually about a friend's father. And dad knew that I'd been cracking jokes about him for years. In fact, often I would ask his permission and he'd always say, go for your life, because he was a really funny guy. But for whatever reason, I think he was extremely unhappy at the time. That joke just tore it. And so uh, he disowned me by fax. And uh, don't laugh too hard, because he died six weeks later. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was pretty terrible at the time. And then my brother and I had to put, um, well, it's not that it's not terrible now. Um, <laughs> my brother and I had to put mum into a home because uh, the good times really did keep on rolling. And when we moved her in, we saw a couple of uh, footy t tipping competitions on the wall. And we thought, great, you know, because mum really loved her footy. But then we noticed that a couple of the names had lines through them. And I remember thinking to myself, well, there's an added element of excitement. <laughs> Not only by the end of the season, how many matches will I have picked, but will I still be alive? So unfortunately, um, mum died 10 months after dad. Look, I'll be frank with you, not a great couple of years. But then I wrote this book about them. And I do have to say that, uh, oh look, it was no day at the beach, to be honest. Like I, I would challenge anyone to think about their childhood, no matter how great it was, as an adult, kind of day in, day out for a year, without it bringing up some stuff and making you feel a little bit crazy. It was a little bit like doing therapy on speed, actually. But um, I can honestly say that when I finished writing the first draft, I honestly remember, I was sitting down, and I honestly remember just thinking, well, even if no one buys this turkey, I'm really glad I wrote it. Because I can honestly say that I guess thinking about mum and dad so much as an adult, I, um, I just came to understand them a lot better. I felt I came to know them. I just know them in a different way, I suppose, especially my mum. And while there is no denying that they were not the greatest parents in the world, you know, they were really wrapped up in each other and themselves. They argued pretty much every night. Not a lot of affection in the house, but honestly, writing the book made me go, I know that they truly loved me and I truly loved them. And I honestly believe that they gave it their best shot. And I think most parents do. And there's actually a line from a Tim Winton book where he says, things are never over. And I really feel that about my relationship with mum and dad. Like I actually feel my relationship with them is ongoing. And I honestly feel closer to them now than I did when they were alive. <laughs> Might be because I don't have to actually see them. But, <laughs> In some ways it's lousy timing, but hey, better late than never. So I thought I would just read you the uh, last page from the book. You know the story, so it's not going to spoil anything. Sorry, I'm producing a lot of saliva today. I don't know what that's about. Um, I will confess too much information, sorry. <laughs> I will confess that I would, would have given a lot to have felt mum and dad around me just after they died, as some people claim they do. I would have been satisfied with a dream or a sign like a can of beer or a container of laxatives flying at me, but nothing. I even consider going to see Mr. Crossing Over, John Edward. Instead, I may deal with playing Neil Diamond, dad's favorite, and Van Morrison, we played that at mum's funeral, until the wee hours while clutching a wine bottle or three along with drunken phone calls to my brother who was in a similar state on the other side of the country. 
that passes as you, as you have to get back to your life and you think of them at birthdays and Christmases or whenever something you can't even quite explain triggers a memory. You think of things like the fact that they will never meet your partner or if you get married they won't be there. And now so many questions will remain unanswered. I cannot believe that I didn't ask more about their lives in Ireland and what drew them to each other. For a long time I simply didn't consider my parents having lives before I existed and now it is too late. I did wind up seeing a psychic who told me that dad had forgiven me and that we were always best friends. I cried then and I'm crying now. Mind you, she also told me that mum said I should buy a scarf and dad said I should start gardening. <laughs> and then I wrote this book. The main reason was because one of Jan's, she's my birth mother, one of Jan's nieces heard a joke I cracked about dad in my last show and remarked that I must have hated my parents. I was shocked when this was mentioned to me. No, I said, I really loved them. Who doesn't love their parents? Thank you.